Uh, I'm Jonathan Katz. I'm chairman of the OSU Department of History. Uh, the Holocaust Memorial Program has been an ongoing uh, tradition at Oregon State now for 24 years. I particularly want to thank Mimi Orzek, a former OSU Vice Provost, for her part initiating this annual commemoration. And I wish to thank my colleague, Professor Paul Copperman, who for many years now has worked diligently to assure that it continues. I also want to acknowledge the support of the Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Care Foundation, whose generosity over the past four years has helped ensure the success of our efforts. More than a decade ago, the planning committee of the Holocaust Memorial Program decided that if we were to be true to our motto of remember the past, change the future, then our efforts could not and should not be restricted exclusively to bearing witness to the memory of Europe's murdered Jewry. As enormous and as singularly horrific as that chapter in modern history is. For women and men of my generation, despite our resolution that genocide should never happen again, we have found ourselves too often speechless bystanders as mass murder took place in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur. In recent years, the Holocaust Memorial Program has brought to campus speakers to talk about these tragic events, as well as the earlier Armenian genocide and Stalin's murderous regime. And so it is fitting tonight that our speaker, who is at the forefront of the burgeoning field of comparative genocide studies, will address the question, was the 20th century the century of genocide? Eric Weitz is eminently suited to this task. Chairman of the Department of History at the University of Minnesota, he holds the title of Distinguished McKnight University Professor and Arsham and Charlotte Ohanesian Chair in the College of Liberal Arts. Trained in the fields of modern German and Russian history, Professor Weitz has over the past three decades authored and edited a continuous stream of books, chapters, and journal articles on European politics and social and intellectual history. He is the editor of the Princeton University Press monograph series, Human Rights and Crimes Against Humanity. His ongoing work in the field of comparative genocide culminated in his, in his 2003 book, A Century of Genocide, Utopias of Race, and nation. And if you're interested, uh, the book is available for purchase after, outside, as well as uh, Dr. Weitz's more recent work, Weimar Germany. In his book, A Century of Genocide, Professor Weitz examines the ideological underpinnings of mass murder in the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and more recently in Cambodia and the former Yugoslavia. In each instance, leaders called for the creation of a new humanity in the service of a revolutionary and utopian future. To help us understand how this vision turned into an invitation to genocide and murder, join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Eric Weitz. Thank you. <laughs> uh, th thank you for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for um, inviting me here. This is my very first time in Oregon, actually, and I wish I was actually here longer. And thank you all also for coming out on a lovely, lovely evening for a talk on genocide. I often feel like, you know, the guy who ruins the dinner party you know, I'm at dinner with uh, people and someone turns to me and says, what do you do? And I say, oh, I write about genocide, you know, boom, end of conversation. <laughs> and it uh, takes, you know, the host or hostess kind of stammer around to figure out how to restart things. One time, I'll just tell you this one story. Uh, one time, and the, my fellow historians will appreciate this, I was at our annual meeting at the American Historical Association. 
This is when I was writing the book on genocide. And I literally had one leg in a cab. I was going to dinner with a friend and a very eminent historian who shall remain nameless, uh, socially inept as most academics are. You know, I can't talk about anything except you know, our work. He says, uh, uh, Eric, uh, what are you working on now? Yeah, I've got one leg in the taxi. And I say, and I was stupid enough to answer him at that moment. I say, well, I'm writing a book on genocide. And you know, everybody stopped. I mean, the taxi cab driver turned around and looked at me. Everybody who was in line waiting for taxi cab drivers, taxis stopped. The bellman at the door of the hotel stopped. They're all looking at me. And I felt like saying, I don't do genocide. You know, I, <laughs> I write about it and I teach about it. So again, thank you for coming out. And you know, I, I, I know why people come, because this is one of the major cultural, moral, political problems of our time. Uh, it's why you know, I almost feel like I'm teaching uh, you know, my history of Nazi Germany or my comparative genocide course. It brings students out, and it brings out, of course, you know, the, the, the few of you in the audience who are, uh, who are older than, the, than college student age, because we know it's important. So yes, I want to talk to you this evening, and in particular about, I, I'll, I'll compare the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust, the two cases that I'll go into most depth about, but also I might along the way make some comparative comments to other genocides as well. Genocides have existed for as long as we have recorded history. There are instances of it in the Hebrew Bible, of the Amalekites, of Joshua and, and Jericho. There are instances in Greek history, uh, the, the, the Malian men who were slaughtered by the Athenians. There are instances in Roman history, the Caribbean Arawak population that was virtually completely eliminated by the Spani Spanish uh, conquistadores. So we have examples going way back. We have examples from all around the world. But there's something different, I think, about modern genocides, about 20th century genocides, and perhaps, unfortunately, going into the 21st century as well. It's partly a question of scale. 20th century genocides kill more people, many, many more people, than genocides in earlier periods. We seem to have hover around this figure of 60%, for um, almost around 60% of European Jews, around 60% of the Armenian population, around 60% of the Herero of Southwest Africa, killed deliberately, intentionally by the German military in the first decade of the 20th century. So there is an issue of scale here that makes modern genocides more deadly. The body count, to put it crassly, is higher. But it seems to me we can't rest with a, a body count approach to history that's not very satisfying to say the least. Modern genocides are different also because they are more systematic in nature. They're more organized. And typically in the 20th century, that organized body is the state. Not all states, of course, thankfully, but some states. And modern states have capacities, technological and bureaucratic capacities that no king, emperor, sultan, czar, none of these, these early modern or pre-modern rulers could have envisaged a state, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with the capacities of the 20th century state. And when those capacities are turned on the goal of human destruction, as they are in genocides, when they're turned on human destruction, then the consequences are deadly indeed. And in some cases, genocides move into the very center of state activity. That is, they become the motivating drive of state policies so that states 
organize all the resources available to them for the process of human destruction, for the deliberate, intentional destruction of particular population groups. And that's you know, more or less the, the, the UN Convention on Genocide. That is the intentional destruction. The UN Convention goes in whole or in part of, quote, racial, ethnical, ethnical was the word in 19, the 1940s. Today we would say ethnic, racial, ethnical, national, or religious groups. So intention is critical. And this, I think, was certainly the case with the Holocaust, that is, that the deliberate annihilation of European Jews moved to the very center of state goals and state activity under Nazi Germany. I think we can say the same for the Armenian Genocide under the Young Turks. We can say the same for the Rwandan Genocide. Again, this doesn't always happen, but in those cases when it does, when genocide becomes the primary motive of state policy, even if it's just for a period of time, maybe a brief period of time, may just be months, as in the Rwandan case, then we have you know, destruction on, on, on a vaster scale than could have been imagined, could have been foreseen under earlier state systems. To carry out genocide, states employ armies, bureaucrats, paramilitary organizations, they do all that, but they also mobilize populations to engage in the work of destruction. You know, it would be an easy task if we could say that there were three Nazis, three young Turks, three members of Hutu power in Rwanda who were the um, agents of genocide. If it was only, you know, the three leaders at the top, we could try them maybe hang them, you know, maybe execute them in some other fashion, and that would be the end of it. But in fact, mod again, and this is how modern 20th century genocides are different. Modern genocides, the corrupting influence travels deep down into society. That is, regular people become involved in the work of human annihilation. They, be, they become the deliberate killers, the, act, the people who actually do the killing. They become the jail keepers, perhaps. Uh, they become the, the Turks who take the farms and the furnishings of Armenians who are deported and then killed. The people all, the, all over Europe who took the apartments, furnishings, and so on of, Jewish, of Jews all over Europe. The people who, when the paramilitaries come, when the Serb paramilitaries come to, into northern Bosnia in the early 90s, and the paramilitaries say, where are the Muslims? And they say, they're down there. Or Nazi occupation officers come into towns and say, where do the Jews live? And people say, over there. That's where you can find them. In that kind of way, genocide becomes a social project, and not just the work of a few leaders at the top. Again, if it were a few leaders, we'd have an easy legal, political, moral reckoning with genocide. But in fact, because they become social projects, modern genocides mean that every post-genocidal society is haunted by its past, even and perhaps especially so in those cases where the states and society try to deliberately deny the fact of genocide. And the most blatant case today is the Republic of Turkey. So I want to elaborate this perspective, you know, these different items about state power, ideology, popular participation, again, by looking at the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust in particular. But I want to address, address at first and for a few moments what is sometimes a difficult issue. We, at least, you know, we scholars, academics, are way past, way past characterizing the Holocaust as unique, but that's not the case in the popular discussion, the popular perception 
of the Holocaust, particularly, I would say, in Germany, particularly in North America, perhaps particularly in Israel as well. There are, of course, still powerful voices that argue for the uniqueness of the Holocaust. Among historians, Don Dina, a German-Israeli historian, is perhaps the most intellectually sophisticated. But the thrust of recent scholarship, as evidenced by conferences, by journals, by publications, is clearly in the comparative direction, and I would say, thankfully and productively. Uniqueness is, at best, a theological concept, a theological argument, not a position subject to normal scholarly and political debate. To say that the Holocaust was, again, quote unquote, unique is to make the Holocaust otherworldly, not something that was actually carried out by men and a few women, by some men and a few women, to other people. That is, it was a human activity, and we need to explain it with the tools that, I'm a historian, that historians bring to any kind of a historical event philosophers, political scientists, others might use their tools of analysis. But in any case, we need to, to, to subject it to our normal tools of investigation and not place it out there as if it cannot be understood. And, you know, there are, uh, Dandina would argue that it is not really understandable, and many other people would. And there I beg to differ. If we say it's not understandable, I think we surrender our intellect to the event as horrific as it was. Or, you know, the term uniqueness is simply a mundane observation because every event is unique in time and place. No event is replicable exactly as it was, but again, that's, that's a pretty mundane, you know, matter of fact point that we, we really don't need to belabor. So to stake out the comparative terrain, to say that there are other genocides that we can discuss in conjunction with the Holocaust, recognizing again that, not every, that, that, that they're all not exactly the same. They each have the, their own particular characteristics. But that does not mean at all any diminishing or any relativization of the Holocaust. The Holocaust was an atrocity of enormous dimensions, the greatest tragedy in Jewish history. It was a quote unquote civilizational rupture to quote Dandina. That's a very powerful term, I think, a civilizational rupture. But I don't see any intellectual, moral, or political reasons why we should not also consider as civilizational ruptures the killing of the Herero and Nama in Southwest Africa again in the first decade of the 20th century, the destruction of the Armenian population in 1915 and 1916 and beyond, the mur systematic murder of Tutsis and moderate Hutus in 1994. All of these, it seems to me, constitute civilizational ruptures. The complete breaking of the bonds of human solidarity. All of these should inspire, as the Holocaust has inspired, the moral, political, indeed theological reflections that have gone on in the 65 years since World War II in relation to the Holocaust. In other words, they should have the same valence, the same power for us as does the Holocaust. As Elazar Barkan, a, a very good scholar, argues, the Holocaust is, the, his term, the non-paradigmatic genocide. In other words, the non-model. The case that makes least sense to hold up there, at least in scholarly, scholarly terms, to hold up as the ideal type to which other genocides have to be measured. And the, it, it had its particular features, as all genocides have their particular features. In the case of the Holocaust, its particular features have everything to do with Germany's highly developed bureaucratic and military culture, that is, with the historical features of German, Germany, 
which enabled the Nazis, once they had seized power, to use the highly developed organs of the state and the military and their own party for the task of annihilation. The other important distinctive characteristic of Germany was, of course, its great power status, which contributed to very, very grand territorial ambitions in Europe and indeed globally, as I'll talk about, much grander than most other genocides of the 20th century. Serbia in the 1990s, Rwanda in the 1990s, the colony of Southwest Africa. I mean, none of these had, were places of grand imperial thinking, of territorial aggrandizement on the scale of modern Germany. But, but the Ottoman Empire around World War I under the Young Turks comes close. Not quite there, but close. So, to think about the Holocaust in conjunction with other genocides, again, doesn't mean at all diminishing the tragedy, the atrocities, but it does mean recognizing that other regimes have sought to carry out the annihilation of distinctive populations, populations most often that were defined along nation, national or racial lines. Now, the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust share many characteristics. Again, they were not, nothing is ever exactly the same, but you know, by looking at them, I think we, in, in, in conjunction with one another, I think we get greater insight both into similarities and differences. And they're linked in, in many ways. Uh, now it's time for, how do I do this? Let's see if I got that right. I'll get to him in a second. Uh, first, they are linked by the sheer fact of the enormity of the disaster that befell both population, Jews in Europe and Armenians in Anatolia. They are linked by the sense of impunity that the perpetrators had, that Nazi the Nazi elite, Nazi bureaucrats, the large, large number of auxiliaries from many European countries that the Nazis mobilized to carry out the annihilation of the Jews, all of them with a sense of impunity that they could do what they wanted, so thought also the young Turk government of the late Ottoman Empire and its many party affiliates and the Kurdish tribes, and the special organization, the paramilitary organization that, the formal name for the Young Turk Party, the, the Committee of Union and Progress, set to work in the destruction of the Armenian population. They are linked similar in the historical context. And here, two, two things are important. One is the large historical ideological historical vision of both Nazi leaders and young Turk leaders. And I'll, I'll be more specific about this in a few minutes. And second, the fact that both genocides occurred in the context of war. And that's very critical. War is the critical context for the unleashing of genocide. It's a manner of implementation that's very similar. The organization of annihilation was similar in both cases. And they are also linked, interestingly, in a kind of counter direction, by two great humanitarians who opposed the genocidal policies of both regimes, Raphael Lemkin here and Armin Wegner here. Now, Wegner, I mean, many of you have probably heard of Raphael Lemkin. I dare say that few of you have heard of Armin Wegner. Wegner was, you know, the Ottoman Empire was allied with Germany in World War I. Wegner was a medic in the German army stationed in Anatolia, core of the Ottoman Empire. And he was outraged, as most of his superiors were not outraged. He was outraged at the atrocities being committed 
against Armenians, and he secretly took photos of the genocide as it was in play. And we have a photographic record of the Armenian genocide, largely because of Armin Vegna. He came into, he came under severe criticism by his officers. He managed to smuggle the photographs out. This is one of the iconic photos we have of the Armenian genocide. The mother with her baby being, you know, pushed through, no doubt the deserts, into the desert regions of northern Syria and, and, and Iraq. You can see the, uh, what's probably a gendarme behind her over, uh, over here. Famished, malnourished, dehydrated, dehydrated, making their way across the desert. And this image is as iconic as is this, which you know many of you have probably seen the young Jewish boy with the raised hand with the German soldiers or SS men, I can't quite tell from this, behind them with the rifles pointed. And there are a number, this too, another iconic photo of the, the lines of refugees being dispatched from the core areas, the six provinces, and here you can see the dead bodies that you know, the uh, subsequent streams of refugees encountered as they were pushed out of, again, the, the, the six, especially the six provinces in eastern Anatolia where most of the Armenian population lived. And here, exhausted refugees on the way. And by the way, again, I'll come back to all this in a little more detail. The news of the Armenian genocide traveled very, very quickly. Uh, America was not yet at war and actually never declared war against the Ottoman Empire. Uh, American missionaries were in the Ottoman Empire. German Scandinavian missionaries were present then. This is Winona's Minnesota, by the way. So this is my local patriotism. Um, and you see, uh, the, the, I can't see the date, but it, uh, I, I know this from the original source. It's, it's 1915. Armenians will be exterminated. So reports got out very quickly from the spring of 1915 into 1916. And, um, Vegna, very significantly, 20 years later, protested the persecution of Jews in the Third Reich, wrote a letter to no less than Adolf Hitler, and that landed him some period of time in a concentration camp in the 1930s. So, you know, the link here is someone like Vegna understood the connections between the atrocities being committed against Armenians in World War I and the persecution of Jews under the Third Reich. And Raphael uh, Lemkin, may, uh, many of you probably know, uh, coined the word genocide uh, and went on a one-man campaign in the, in the last years of World War II and then right afterward to get the genocide convention passed. Lemkin was uh, uh, an international lawyer, a Polish Jew, who then emigrated to various places and finally ended up in the United States. After the war, he learned that 49 members of his own family had been killed in the Holocaust. And as he was wrestling in the 1930s and 1940s for a word, a concept, that could ca convey the, 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 set, the meaning of the annihilation, the systematic annihilation of a, of a particular population. He hit upon using the, the Greek word genus for a group with the suffix side for murder in, in Latin, came up with the word genocide. And as he related in his book, Axis Rule and Occupied Europe, 
He had been a law student in Germany in 1921. And I'm racing ahead of the story, but we'll come back to it, don't worry. Uh, and he was a law student in Germany in 1921. Salomon Telerian, a young Armenian, was brought, was indicted and tried for the assassination in Berlin of Talat Pasha. Talat Pasha was interior minister of the Ottoman government. Talat Pasha was the main, certainly not the only, but the main architect of the Armenian genocide. Telerian um, shot him in broad daylight, 1921. I actually didn't know until a few weeks ago, uh, not a few months ago, that I had walked by the place in Berlin many, many, many times where Telerian shot Talat. The jury in Berlin set Telerian free. And the courtroom erupted in applause when it did. There was no doubt that he had committed a crime, that he had assassinated Talat Pasha, but the jury felt that the f fact that so many members of Telerian's own family had been killed in the Armenian genocide mitigated the crime that Talat committed. So Lemkin, as he tells the story, went to his law professor and said, isn't there a concept for the crime of killing an entire population? And the law professor said, no. There's a crime for killing individuals, but we have no concept for the annihilation of an entire population. And that sent Lemkin on the intellectual quest that would ultimately lead to his coinage of the word genocide and his one man, his almost monomaniacal campaign to get the Genocide Convention passed in 1948, as it was by the General Assembly. But, and this is the point, Lemkin understood also the connection between the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust. That is, he did not only reflect upon the tragedy of the Jews, he reflected upon other populations as well. So in that way also, we can see links between the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust. Okay. Let me go into some more detail here about these two cases. Genocidal regimes are radical simplifiers. They reduce the variety of human identities to one single racial or national identity. In other words, you know, we all have complex identities. We have religious, local, national, religious, whatever, gender, a whole complex of identities. Gen genocidal regimes reduce that to the particular nation or the particular race. And invariably, the regimes in question employ the powerful motive, uh, powerful metaphors of cleanliness and purity. That, those are the good things, of course, the good race, you know, Aryans, Turks, and others are categorized as impure and unclean. And we can see in both the late Ottoman Empire and in Nazi Germany, the way in which Armenians and Jews get categorized as the consummate others. There were, of course, long-standing religious prejudices in both places, Muslim prejudices against uh, Christians, Christian prejudices against Jews, but the kinds of severe categorical dismissals, dehumanizations of the other group were different, of a different quality. They emerged in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And they emerged partly because both Armenians in the Ottoman Empire and Jews in Germany and in Europe, that their communal and individual lives flourished with the onset of modernity, to use the most general term. That is, Jews became, at least in Germany, became more prosperous, took advantage of the many cultural, business, and intellectual opportunities available to them with the onset of more modern society in the course of the 19th century. 
The same was true of Armenians and Greeks in the Ottoman Empire who became, in many cases, connected to France, other places abroad. Armenians and Greeks became the intermediaries between Muslim Turkish populations and government officials and the European societies further afield. And Armenians and Greeks became wealthier over the course of the 19th century. And both groups became targets of resentment for many others, for many others. German officials, well, all, all sor sorts of Germans in the Ottoman Empire I identified it as a major site of German imperial expansion. And many German intellectuals, business leaders, government officials use similar language about the Armenians as they did about Jews at home. The long-serving German ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, Marshal von Bieberstein, who was a very acute observer of the Ottoman Empire, wrote continually in his reports back to his superiors in Berlin that the Armenians and Greeks are the Jews of the Ottoman Empire. And that's not a compliment, in case you were wondering. They're the Jews of the Ottoman Empire. And Armenians and Greeks do to Turkish peasants what Jews do to the peasants of Eastern Europe. They exploit them. They use them. They are, they are money lenders. And lurking behind these sentiments was the notion that Armenians were, quote unquote, a problem. Germany wanted a stable Ottoman Empire through which it could exercise economic and political influence. As Armenians, or some Armenians, became politically active, became nationalists, German officials in the Ottoman Empire began to see them as a problem. And of course, in Germany itself, in Nazi Germany itself, Jews were seen by the Nazi regime as the obstacle to the progress, the productivity, to the flourishing, to the efflorescence of German life. In the words of, words of Shaul Friedländer, the story of Shaul Friedländer, the Nazis posited a redemptive anti-Semitism. In other words, only through the removal of the Jews would German life flourish. Now, genocides are contingent political acts. Genocides are always choices. There's nothing whatsoever inevitable about them. This was certainly the case under National Socialism. And I probably don't need to go into a lot of detail here. But in both Nazi Germany and in the Ottoman Empire, the visions of a grand historical awakening were very powerful motivating factors. It comes across in Hitler's own writings. It comes across in Mein Kampf. It comes across in his Hitler's unpublished second book. It comes across in all sorts of ideological, uh, late night ideological ramblings when he gathers his cronies and they all probably want to go to sleep, but they have to listen to him rant and rave until 2, 3, and 4 o'clock in the morning. This is Hitler's table talk. The future was to be a racial imperium presided over by Aryans. This was utopia on a grand scale. Again, only through the elimination of Jews could this utopia be accomplished. And as this vision became even more radical in the course of World War II, it became not only a European vision, but indeed a global vision. And in Hitler's ramblings at late at night, there's even talk of you know, conquest of the Americas, and I think this is, this is serious. That is that if the conquest of Europe had proven successful, and then you know, through the Soviet Union to the Pacific, the Nazis really did envisage, not, not initially, but in the course of the war, really did envisage a global empire. But what did the young Turks want? And here, 
the answers are less clear and the scholarship is more divided. The Young Turks came to power in a revolution in 1908. They were, by and large, young military officers, professionals from middling backgrounds who were frustrated by the decline of the Ottoman Empire and by their own limited chances for advancement. They were initially liberals, constitutionalists. When they staged their revolution in 1908, it was celebrated all over the empire, Armenians, Greeks, Jews, Arabs. Everyone celebrated the 1908 revolution. But then came a series of blistering defeats. The Ottoman Empire, maybe we should go to the map here, the Ottoman Empire lost Libya in 1911 to, to Italy. What was that? <laughs> it lost Italy, uh, <laughs> Libya to Italy in 1911. It lost the southeastern European territories for the most part to the Balkan states in the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913. And here the Young Turks suffered not only a great political and military defeat, but they suffered something very personal. They lost their own homelands. Most of the Young Turk leaders were from Albania, from Salonika. They were, in other words, from the Balkans. And when those places were lost, to Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, it was a very deeply felt personal loss on the part of the Young Turks. And they began to move from their original liberal constitutionalist ideas, hesitantly, moved hesitantly and with lots of contradictions, to a vision of a recast Ottoman Empire, and this is an empire, you know, one of the great early modern empires that had been around for 600 years, began to move to a vision of a recast empire that would be more Turkic, not just Muslim, but Turkic in nature, and began to imagine this empire going, not only recapturing the European lands that it had lost, the North African and Middle Eastern lands it, they had, it had lost, but also going through the Caucasus and on into Central Asia from where the Turkic, the, the, the Ottomans had originally come. In other words, they too begin imagining a very, very large empire, something like a national empire in the modern era, vast territorial ambitions, and it's the Armenians who are the problem because the Armenians live primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in eastern Anatolia. They were the last major Christian population left in the empire. And if there was going to be this big empire that went through the Caucasus and on into Central Asia, the Armenians stood in the way. And then came, of course, the outbreak of World War I. And as I mentioned earlier, both world wars were critical. Without World War I, it's very hard to imagine the genocide of the Armenians. Without World War II, it's very hard to imagine the genocide of the Jews. War does various things. War, war is, you know, most basically, an act of violence. War inspires a culture of violence. In wartime, regimes do things, think they can do things that they would never imagine doing in peacetime. They could take far more radical measures. The Ottoman Empire decided to go into World War I on the side of the Central Powers, on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary. Very quickly, in early 1915, the war starts to go very, very bad for the Ottomans. There's a major defeat in the Caucasus at Sarakamesh against the Russians, and the British start threatening the approaches to Istanbul with the Dardanelles campaign. 
And before Mel Gibson became, you know, a total idiot and anti-Semite, he actually made some good movies. Uh, and there was a long ago movie, an Australian movie about Gallipoli, the, the British invasion of the Dardanelles, um, which depicted quite well what was ultimately a British disaster. But the young Turk leaders start panicking at the approach of British and Commonwealth forces and the Dardanelles, and again, the loss to the Russians in the Caucasus. And they start turning on the Armenians precisely at this moment of panic and catastrophe, seeing the Armenians, whom they had already identified as a problem, as now an existential threat. The eternal enemy who would ally with the Russians and destroy the Ottoman Empire and create, with the help of the Russians and the British and the French, an independent Armenia in eastern Anatolia. At the same time that they are panicking, they are also imagining this grand empire. In other words, there's a sense of panic and euphoria at the same time. And it's very similar to what happens with the Holocaust. Although there is a popular notion that the Holocaust was inevitable once the Nazis came to power, for historians, we situate the Holocaust in the context of the Second World War. In other words, there had been massacres of Jews before the invasion of the Soviet Union. But it's only in the context of the war in the Soviet Union that the Holocaust becomes systematic. For some historians, it's the sense of euphoria that Nazi leaders have in the summer of 1941 as the campaign goes so rapidly against the Soviet Union. German generals are saying in July 1941 that they will defeat the Soviet Union in two weeks. I mean, it's an amazing act of hubris on their part. Unbelievable, given what we know, thankfully, about the course of the war. But in July 1941, they're imagining that they will defeat the entire Soviet Union in two weeks. And some Nazis, like Himmler, say, well, now that we're on the roll, let's just do what we always want to do and kill all the Jews. So it's that sense of euphoria at victory. On the other hand, right after that, the war starts to turn. In September and then in October 1941, the Soviets hold off the Germans at Moscow. It will be you know, another number of uh, you know, three and a half, four years of very bitter war, very bitter fighting until Germany is ultimately defeated. But there is a sense of panic in the Nazi leadership at the fact that the Soviets hold off the, until this point, invincible German army. And the Nazis actually don't know how to fight a war that they don't win rapidly. They'll cause immense destruction, but they don't know how to fight something that's not blitzkrieg. And here too you see the same kind, the same combination of euphoria and despair. And some, some Nazi leaders you know, have, have both sentiments. Some um, you know, uh, represent different points of view. But the point here is that it's war. It's the context of war, it's the euphoria and despair of war, the culture of violence of war, the sense that you can do things in war that you can't normally do in peacetime that lead to the unfolding of the genocides against both Jews and Germans. And in this process, in this process of genocide, we also see parallel forms of implementation. From the Wannsee Conference in, ja in uh, late January 1942, we know that the Nazis have a systematic plan for the annihilation of the Jews. This will involve Nazi agencies, the SS primarily, which has primary responsibility for carrying out the genocide. But it will also involve state bureaucrats. The, 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 the ministries that run the railroads and the like. It will involve other Nazi party agencies. There's, in other words, a parallel process of implementation of the regular state, the party apparatus, and around them, 
all the complicity that I talked about at the beginning, the mobilization of auxiliary killers in Latvia and Lithuania and Ukraine and all sorts of places, the mobilization of populations to participate in the plundering of Jewish assets, of Jewish wealth, where all this becomes a formal state project and a social project as well. And we can see something very similar in the Armenian genocide. The orders go out, and we actually, we, I should mention, uh, just in the last 10 years, the scholarship on the Armenian genocide has just you know, exploded. Uh, I probably shouldn't use a military metaphor when we're talking about things like genocide. Uh, it has blossomed, shall we say. Maybe that's a better metaphor. Uh, and we, you know, we know immensely more. My friend Tana Akcham was here two years ago, three years ago. Uh, and Tana has been you know, a pioneer in this scholarship. Uh, and there are, interestingly, young, now, I mean, it's a handful, but a, but a very good handful of young, Turkish scholars or of Turkish background, many of them educated in Europe or the United States, who are now working on this. And of course, they bring the languages. You know, to do, to do research on Nazi Germany is easy. You need German. That's sort of like big deal as a, as a foreign language. And if you're really good, you can do Russian and Polish as well these days. But to do the Armenian genocide, you need Ottoman Turkish, modern Turkish, um, Armenian helps also, and you know, not, there's almost no one who's not born Armenian who, who knows Armenian. But we have these young, younger guys, and they're all, well, no, I shouldn't say just guys. There are a few women there, too, who have the, the, the multiple languages that one needs to work through these, the, these documents. And what we know now, better than we knew 10 years ago, is the process of extermination of the Armenians, and it's very similar in that it works through both the state bureaucracy, orders go out from the Ministry of the Interior, from Talat's ministry, to provincial governors and so on, all around Anatolia, ordering the deportation of the Armenians, following up on it, asking, you know, where is that column of refugees, what's happening to them, and things like that. But the orders also go through the Young Turk Party organization as well. And again, the same kind of use of auxiliaries, paramilitaries, the special organization, Kurdish bands, as well as the population that participates in the genocidal process. So there, too, we see similar processes. And one has to say also that the end of the genocides becomes the foundational act for the political and social orders that follow. In other words, the Republic of Turkey is built upon the genocide of the Armenians. It's built upon Turkish, the development of a Turkish bourgeoisie is built upon the seizure of Armenian assets in the genocide. And similar, similarly, a more homogeneous Central and Eastern Europe was built upon the genocide of the Jews. Central and Eastern Europe was never so homo homogeneous as it was after 1945. Now there's one great area of difference, and this is where I will end, uh, between the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust. After World War II, Germany assumed legal, moral, and economic obligations to the Jewish survivors of the Nazi Holocaust and now, finally, to other victims of Nazi crimes. None of this happened easily, to be sure. None of this happened without resentment. The first post-war West German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, had to bring his own party along, kicking and screaming, to the 1952 reparations agreement with Israel. It didn't happen easily. The payments to survivors were always insufficient. And ultimately, of course, nothing, absolutely nothing, could recompense Jews for the, for the loss of their loved ones in the Holocaust. But starting with 1952, Germany did assume its obligations. And with extensive school curricula about the Nazi period and the Holocaust, memorials, monuments, museums, all over the country, not just in Berlin, Germany has become a model 
for how a country comes to terms with the past and moves beyond the commission of atrocities in its name. In stark contrast, the present Turkish state is a model for denying the past, refusing to recognize any of the injustices perpetrated by its predecessor. Critical Turks who venture to write about and research the Armenian genocide sometimes risk their lives, literally so in the case of the Turkish-Armenian journalist uh, Haran Think, who was assassinated in Istanbul two years ago. And that kind of denial is also a denial of the contributions of humanitarian Turks and other Muslims who saved Armenians. And we're only now just beginning to get research on this topic. You know, Israel uh, has um, um, Yad, Yad Vashem, the what of the righteous? Hmm? The, uh, I'm blanking on the name. But, but, you know, the honoring of righteous Gentiles who protected and saved Jews. And again, we're just beginning to get research on this by Richard Hovhannissian, by others, about the Muslims who, and the Turks, uh, who protected their Armenian neighbors. The stance of the Turkish government just, I mean, literally dishonors those people, as well as people like Amin Vegna and Rafael Lemkin. In Eichmann in Jerusalem, her report and analysis of the trial of the SS bureaucrat Adolf Eichmann, Hannah Arendt wrote that even if only one or two Germans, and we know there are more, even if only one or two Germans refused to follow Nazi orders to kill Jews, that suffices to show that no murderous, no dictatorial regime can ever win the absolute, total, complete compliance of its population. Some people, however few in number, will find their moral core, however they find it, political commitments, religious commitments, they'll find their moral core and protest or protect their endangered neighbors, often at great risk to themselves. And now from the research of Tana Akcham, and again Richard Hovhannissi, again, we're starting to know about Turks like that. Those are the people from whom we can take sustenance, from whom we can imagine a more humane future despite the enormous tragedies of genocide. The humanitarianism of Wegner Vag- and Lemkin and many individuals, their names often unknown to us and you know, will never be known to us, who try to protect Armenians and Jews show us you know, another way that the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust are linked by those people whom we can look to as models for a more humane existence among the diverse peoples who make up our world. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>